Good evening. My name is Mark Syme. I'm the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday. Oh, let's see. This is November the 24th. We will sing several songs. We will observe the Lord's Supper. And I have a message for you that I hope will be beneficial. Here at Northfield, we sing from the songbook, Songs of Faith and Praise. I will give you the number of the song and the name, just in case you don't have that songbook. Uh, if you have a different one, you can find the song or perhaps Google the song so that you can sing along with us. The first song that we will sing this evening is number 422, Spirit of the Living God, 422. Spirit of the Living God. <clears throat> Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Number 172. 172. I just came to praise the Lord. 172. I just came to praise the Lord. <clears throat> I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to praise his holy name. I just came to praise the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to praise his holy name. I just came to thank the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to love the Lord. I just came to praise His holy name. I just came to love the Lord. And before we partake of the Lord's Supper, Number 335, in memory of the Savior's love. 335, in memory of the Savior's love. <clears throat> in memory of the Savior's love, we keep the sacred feast where every humble contrite heart is made a welcome guest by faith we take the bread of life with which our souls are the cup in token of his blood that was for sinners shed. Beneath his banner thus we sing the wonders of his love. And here anticipate by faith the heavenly feast of love. The 
scriptures tell us that in the early church, they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread. Jesus instituted what we come to know as communion or the Lord's Supper on the night in which he was betrayed when he went into that upper room with his disciples and explained to them what uh, his uh, death and his crucifixion would actually mean. And with that, uh, and it was the Passover season, he said, take this bread, which is a token of my body. And then he said, take this cup, which is a symbol of my blood, which is shed for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul explains it one more time to us. Uh, and uh, very, very, very much alike what Jesus said on that night in which he was betrayed. And so we gather about the table because that's what we're supposed to do on the first day of the week. We are supposed to remember Jesus Christ. We are supposed to remember him crucified. We are supposed to remember him uh, with the beginning of the new covenant that is within him. And so as we gather, let's just hearken back to Calvary with Jesus dying on the cross for each one of us as we partake of the Lord's Supper. Let's give thanks for the bread. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that in your divine plan, you sent Jesus to us at just the right time, that he was the master teacher, that he led the perfect life, that he was tempted as we are today tempted. But the most important thing that we focus on right now is that he gave his life, that we may have life. And so as we partake of this bread, let's remember his body hanging on that cross, the agony that he was in as a man, and remember that this symbolizes his body, which he gave up for each one of us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. give thanks for the cup. Dear God, we are so grateful that Jesus <laughs> was willing to shed his innocent blood. And we know what blood has always symbolized. We know that when the children of Israel sprinkled blood on the doorpost, that the angel of death went over that house. And we know that as we think of the blood that Jesus shed, that because of that blood, that we will be resurrected one day as he was on the third day, and that the angel of death will pass over us. Be with us as we partake of this fruit of the vine, as it symbolizes the blood of Jesus that he shed for us. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. Having completed the Lord's Supper, we are also instructed on the first day of the week to lay by in store and give as we have prospered. We understand that uh, the church is God's kingdom here on earth. It is a kingdom with a mission. It is a kingdom with a, a mission to bring others to Jesus Christ. It is a kingdom with a mission to help those that are in need. And we just come to understand that in this society, that it takes money to do those things. It takes money to keep the church doors open. It keeps money to go out into the world to bring others to the Lord. It takes money to help the needy. And so as we reflect on that, let's reflect in this way that as we give, we will receive. And we understand that the words so succinctly, he that uh, sows sparingly will reap sparingly. And he that sows 
uh, richly and greatly, will reap greatly. <clears throat> and so as we give, help us to give with a cheerful heart and help us to give as we have been purposed. Let's pray for the offering. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we have this opportunity to, to give back. We just pray that those that are in charge of these monies use it in the way that uh, your kingdom on earth will function the way it should, that we will be able to complete our mission here on earth so that one day we will be with you in heaven. Bless us as we give. Hope us to give with an open heart. Help us to give with an open mind and help us to give cheerfully as we have been instructed to do. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we will sing is number 288. 288, Fairest Lord Jesus. 288. Fairest Lord Jesus. <clears throat> Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, oh, Thou of God and man, the Son, Thee will I cherish. to each one of us and uh, we uh, will just now take this time to uh, share a little bit of the Lord's Word with you. I'm going to talk this evening about the work of the Holy Spirit and with that the work of the Holy Spirit in conversion. The night before Jesus was crucified uh, he had a very very busy time didn't he? He instituted the Lord's Supper in Matthew 26, uh, 26 to 28. He washed the apostles' feet, John 13. And he talked with them 
about the work of the Holy Spirit in John 14 to John 16. And then he had a long and very thoughtful prayer to his heavenly father in John 17. And so what was this all about? Well, the Holy Spirit was going to guide the apostles in such a way that at this point in time, they, I don't think, understood. Uh, he was going to guide the apostles into truth, John 16, 13. And Jesus said in John 16, 8, when he, that means the Holy Spirit, comes he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And so with that, how was the Holy Spirit to convict men and women of their sins? Well, the way I look at it, there are only two possible ways. One, uh, there, uh, by, by directly coming into a person's mind and giving him conviction. And two, indirectly, which means that he was going to work through an agent. And that agent is the word of God. Um, then, and only then, God lets each person decide how he or she will react to the gospel that each person is taught. And so as the gospel is taught, each person will make their decision about the gospel. And so with that, let's illustrate how the Holy Spirit worked from the very beginning in the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it says that the apostles were baptized in the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus had promised them. This is Acts 1, 4 to 5. And so after the crowds gathered, Jesus, uh, Jesus, I'm sorry, Peter preached that first gospel sermon to them. And he preached it with these words in Acts 2, 22. Men of Israel, listen to these words. And they were convicted. All right, now here's where we need to uh, get this all straightened out. Uh, they were convicted. What convicted them? Right? A pause. What convicted the people that listened to Peter's words? They were convicted by the words the Holy Spirit guided Peter to say. Remember, Peter was baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so they weren't convicted directly by the Spirit, but indirectly through the agency of the Word of God. Now, let it be known, and we know that from reading the scriptures, not everybody was convicted to follow the gospel message. Some wanted to kill the messenger. We know all about that, don't we? We know that if we kill the messenger, then the message will die. How did that work with killing Jesus? Did the message die? That just doesn't work. Uh, Peter and John were brought before the rulers of Israel, and Peter and John told them that they had killed Jesus. And when the rulers heard this, Acts 5.33, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. They just couldn't take it. And with that, they thought their only alternative was to kill the messengers. Again, people were convicted by the word that was preached, not directly by the Holy Spirit, 
touching their hearts. The Holy Spirit inspired word of God touched their hearts. In the seventh chapter of Acts, Stephen uh, preached a sermon and he preached it to the council in Acts chapter six, verse 12. And he, he showed them how God had worked through all their history. But you know what? And remember, he was talking to Jews. The Jews understood how God had worked with them through the history of their nation. And so many of them resisted. And he said to them in Acts 7, 51, you men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised of the heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Now, how were they resisting the Holy Spirit? Well, I would maintain that they were resisting the Holy Spirit by resisting the word that Stephen preached to them. And so in the first century, the Holy Spirit spoke only through his inspired messengers. We have the story about Philip in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts. He was one of the seven that the apostles laid hands on and then conferred to him miraculous gifts. And he was told by an angel to go toward the south. And when he got there, he saw a man riding in a chariot. And in chapter eight, Verse 29, it says, the spirit, remember, it says, the spirit said to Philip, go up and join this chariot. Now, the spirit didn't speak to the sinner. The spirit didn't speak to the Ethiopian in that chariot. Philip spoke to the Ethiopian. Now, the Ethiopian needed to be saved, but it didn't come directly through the Spirit. It came through the words that Philip taught him, the good news, the gospel. Now, why didn't the Holy Spirit do this directly to the sinner or touch his heart to be convicted? Because even when God did speak to people directly, he spoke to his inspired messengers. In the Old Testament, those were the prophets. God didn't speak to the people. He spoke to the prophets, and they spoke to the people. Jesus had commanded that the gospel was to be preached. By the Spirit? No. When we read the Great Commission in Matthew uh, chapter uh, 28 and in Mark chapter 16, he said the gospel was to be preached by human beings. Christ inspired apostles spoke the same truth. We understand this to be fact in the writings of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 1.21. And in the book of Romans, chapter 10, verses 13 to 17. And for about some eight years or so, after the church was established, the, the gospel was preached literally only to the Jews or to those who were part Jews. Then God decided it was time uh, to allow the Gentiles to enter the church, and now enters Cornelius. Cornelius and his household were the first Gentile converts. When the angel appeared to Cornelius to tell him to send for Peter, here's what, here's what the angel said, Acts chapter 11, verse 14. He will speak words to you, 
which you will be, with which you will be saved, you and your household. Now let's step back. Why didn't the angel tell Cornelius what to do to be saved? Why didn't the Holy Spirit convict Cornelius of sin and save him? Well, you know what? It just wasn't God's plan. God expected then, and he expects today, for his people to preach to the lost. That was the Great Commission in Mark 16, 15, and 16. And so Peter preached to Cornelius, and when he preached to Cornelius, the Holy Spirit was working indirectly, not directly on Cornelius. And so Cornelius and his household were saved by the Holy Spirit-inspired words of Peter, not by the Holy Spirit, indirectly by the Holy Spirit through the words that Peter preached to him. When in uh, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17, the apostle Paul talks about taking on the whole armor of God. He commanded them in chapter 6, verse 17, take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. It's the word of God that touches a person's heart. And that person can then be convicted to obey the, to obey the gospel. Or he can go the other route. He can take the choice of killing the messenger. The Holy Spirit never has nor ever will work directly on the heart of the sinner. He always works indirectly through the word of God. That's why Paul said of the gospel in Romans 1.16, it is the power of God for salvation. Now, to me, it's a sad state of affair when so many people are taught that the Holy Spirit must come on them before they can be saved. The Bible doesn't teach that. Numerous people think that they've had a, a direct experience, a direct revelation with God to be saved. By the way, that didn't even happen in the first century, in the early days of the gospel being preached in all the world. Neither does it happen today. Why? Because that's an emotional thing. Now, do I believe that we have the gift of the Holy Spirit dwelling in us that guides us? Yes, I do. But people's emotions can convince them that they've had an experience with God when it's taught nowhere in the Bible. And what can happen is our emotions can deceive us. The Holy Spirit does convict people of their sins, but he does it, does it through the gospel preached to them. In the Bible, when they were convicted that they were a lost sinner, they were then baptized to have their sins washed away. Just as Saul, who became Paul, was told to do in Acts chapter 22, 16, and this is what Peter preached in Acts 2, 38. He said, arise and be baptized and have your sins washed away. Lost people who are convicted of sin were never told to pray some sinner's prayer and their sins would be forgiven. Why? Because there's no sinner's prayer found in the Bible. If you are convicted that you're lost, if you are convicted that you are separated from God, then you have to go to the Holy Spirit-inspired Word of God, 
to see what your next step is. The Holy Spirit inspired word tells us how to be convicted of God, how to understand that we're sinners and we need to become God's children. Through the Holy Spirit inspired word of God, as we read it and we believe it, we come to understand that we're sinners. And through that, we are told to repent of those sins. And then we are told to confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and then to be baptized for the remission of our sins. This is how the Holy Spirit works in us. It works indirectly through God's Holy Spirit-inspired Word and those that preach that Word to others. And so if you are convicted and lost, that is your invitation this evening. Your invitation is come to the Lord. Come to the Lord, repenting of your sins, confessing Jesus as the Son of God, and being baptized for the remission of your sins. If you need to do that, you can contact us here at Northfield, and we will be there for you. Let's close this with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for this time that we've had together to just look into your Holy Spirit-inspired Word, especially as we look into this Holy Spirit-inspired Word and, and to see the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of people, to see how the Holy Spirit guided uh, men to write uh, the words that are found in our Bibles, the truths of God's Word. Bless us as we uh, walk down the road of our Christian lives to always let your word be a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. Bless us as we here in the kingdom of uh, God here on earth to do the things and say the things and be the godly people that we're to be so that we may one day live with you forever and ever. Continue to bless us. Continue to be with us. We pray this through Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe, and may God bless you all. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, and gratefully sing. Please.